Hi friends and welcome back to chapters 11 and 12 of The Mouse of the Motorcycle by Beverly Cleary. Chapter 11, The Search. I have to go out into the hotel, Ralph informed his relatives. I have to go help the boy. Oh no, not into the hotel, cried Ralph's mother. Not while the housekeeper is looking for mice. If you're seen, we'll all be in danger. I'll be back before dawn, said Ralph. I must go. Don't try to stop me. See here, my boy, aren't you a little bit dramatic, said Uncle Lester. Whatever do you think, whatever do you have to go out into the hotel for? To pilfer a pill, said Ralph, an aspirin tablet. His answer was dramatic enough, even for Uncle Lester. His entire family stared at him in disbelief. Not an aspirin, not after his own father had been poisoned by one of those dreaded tablets. An aspirin? Ralph's mother gasped. Oh no, Ralph, not that, anything but that. It's the only way. Ralph stood tall and brave. The boy has a fever and he needs an aspirin and I'm going to find him one. Oh, Ralph. His mother hid her face in her paws. But Ralph, said Aunt Sissy, remember your father. You can't carry an aspirin in your cheek pouches. It would poison you. How could you get one here? I'll find a way. Ralph was outwardly steadfast in his determination, but inside he was wondering how he would manage to get an aspirin to 215 if he did find one. Roll it? Perhaps? Ralph, stay here, pleaded his mother. You're too young. Let your Uncle Lester go. Well, <laughs> now let's talk this over, said Uncle Lester. I'm not too young, and I haven't a moment to lose. Ralph, who was really frightened by what he was about to do, also enjoyed the drama of the moment. Goodbye, I shall return before dawn. Ralph, promise me you'll be careful, pleaded his mother. Promise me you won't climb the in suitcases like your Aunt Adrian. Ralph's Aunt Adrian, who likes nice things, had climbed into a suitcase to examine nylon stockings when someone closed the suitcase and Aunt Adrian had never been seen again. It was hoped that she'd been carried away to a life of luxury. Promise me, Ralph, cried his mother, but her son was already on his way out the knot hole. Ralph scurried across the carpet to 215, flattened himself and squeezed under the door. Once out in the hall, his courage ebbed. The aspirin tablet seemed like a very small thing to find in a very vast place. It would be much easier to find the motorcycle. No, thought Ralph, I mustn't even think about the motorcycle. Ralph began to feel pretty small himself, much smaller than he had during his show of bravery back in the mouse nest. Down in the lobby, a clock struck one. There was not a moment to lose. He ran to the next room, squeezed under the door, and searched under the beds and dressers while two guests slept soundly. All he found was a bobby pin. He skipped room 211 because of his enemy, the little terrier, was there, and ran to room 209. A hurried search, frightened because of a loud and uneven snoring that came from one of the beds, revealed nothing but a few pretzel crumbs, which Ralph didn't even have time to eat. On and on ran Ralph, down the hall, under doors, under beds, and dressers. There was not a single aspirin tablet to be found. In one of the rooms, he did see a penny that had rolled under the luggage rack and remembered his mother's wish to leave a tip for room service, but tonight he had no time for pennies. He must press on and find the aspirin. A small doubt began to creep into Ralph's thoughts as he ran down the hall to the last room on the second floor. Maybe, maybe there was no aspirin. Maybe he was risking his life and the life of his family for nothing. But Ralph pushed the thought aside. He would not let himself be discouraged. If there was no aspirin on the second floor, there had to be one someplace on the ground floor. Tonight, he was willing to brave the stairs to find out. He flattened himself and squeezed under the last door on the second floor. There was nothing under either of the beds but things that Keith called dust mice. There was no sound but the rattle of the windows in the wind. Ralph started across the carpet towards the dresser when suddenly a light from the bedside table blinded him. He stood, rooted to the carpet by fear, even though it was probably not likely that anyone was going to cut off his tail with a carving knife. He heard someone slip out of bed and utter a sound halfway between a squeal and a scream. Before Ralph knew what was happening, an ordinary drinking glass had been clapped down over him, and there he stood in a glass trap. By then, his eyes were adjusted to the light, and he found himself facing a pair of bare feet. Looking up, he saw that the feet belonged to a young woman in a pink nightgown. Mary Lou, 
wake up, she whispered to the young woman in the other bed. Look what I caught. Huh? Mary Lou blinked and raised one elbow. Her hair was done in pink rollers. Betty, are you out of your mind? It's past one o'clock in the morning. The night was slipping by much too quickly for a trapped mouse. He was terrified and he was desperate. No one in his family had ever been trapped under a drinking glass before. Worst of all, he was failing Keith and endangering his family. Wake up, Mary Lou, and look, insisted Betty. I was going to get up to stop the rattle of the window and I caught a mouse. The news roused Mary Lou from bed, and the two young women knelt on the carpet to look at Ralph, who promptly turned his back. He didn't care to be stared at in his misery, but it was no use. The women moved around to the other side of the glass. Isn't he darling? Look at his cunning little paws. Mary Lou leaned closer for a better look. Oh, and his little ears, aren't they sweet? Betty was delighted. It was disgusting. It was bad enough to be trapped and stared at, but to have the pair carrying on with such a gushy fashion was almost more than Ralph could stomach. Cunning little paws, indeed. They were strong paws. Paws for grasping those hand grips of a motorcycle. Oh, Betty, do, we, do you suppose we could take him back to Wichita with us? Said Mary Lou. My third grade would just love him. So would my kindergarten, agreed Betty. We could keep him in a cage on the ledge and all the children could bring him food from home. It would be such a good experience for them to have a pet in the classroom. Well, thought Ralph grimly, I always wanted to travel. <laughs> a cage in a kindergarten in Wichita, however, was not exactly the destination he had in mind. The minutes were slipping by dangerously fast. He had to do something. Look, he shouted through the glass in desperation. Let me go, please let me go. There's something terribly important I have to do. He squeaked, marveled Betty. He's adorable, squealed Mary Lou. It was no use. Young women could not speak his language. Ralph was in despair. He thought of Keith tossing feverishly in his bed and of his family huddled in the mouse's nest waiting for his safe return. But I don't see how we could take him back to Wichita, said Betty seriously. We're driving to San Francisco and then to Disneyland before we start back. How could we carry him thousands of miles? The two teachers looked thoughtfully at Ralph, who knew his fate depended on this decision. Was he to be carried to Disneyland? and even to the ledge of a kindergarten room in Wichita? Or would they let him go? A third possibility crossed Ralph's mind. Perhaps they would leave him under the glass for the housekeeper to see. He hoped not. He did not think he could last that long. All right, the inside of the glass was beginning to get warm and airless. I suppose we really shouldn't turn him, in, loose, turn him loose in the hotel, said Mary Lou. Mice are pests, even if they are cute. The teacher not only destroyed Ralph's hope, she hurt his feelings as well, calling him a pest when he was on an errand of mercy. From the mouse's point of view, the teachers were the pests. I know, exclaimed Betty suddenly, causing Ralph to look over his shoulder for a clue as to what it was she knew. I know how we can get rid of him without hurting him. The young teacher reached over to the bedside table where she picked, picked up a picture postcard. She slid it carefully under the glass and under Ralph's feet so that he was now standing on the postcard. He noticed the picture was of a giant redwood tree, the same postcard all travelers bought when they came to California. Now, what are you going to do, said Mary Lou. Watch. Betty carefully lifted the postcard, Ralph and the glass, and walked across the room. Even though he knew it was hopeless, Ralph scrabbled around inside his tiny prison. He was afraid she was taking him towards the wash basin. He'd heard of mice being drowned by people who didn't like traps. The teacher walked not to the wash basin, but to the open window. She held Ralph across the sill, removed the postcard from the glass, and gave it a little jerk that shook Ralph off into the vines that grew up to the side of the building. There, she said, closing the window, leaving Ralph clinging to the vines high above the ground. Chapter 12, An Errand of Mercy Owls, thought Ralph, as he clung to the Virginia creeper and filled his lungs with the cool night air that was such a relief after the stuffy drinking glass. I've always wanted to climb down this vine and explore the ground floor, he reminded himself grimly, and now I have to. Ralph had never before been outside beneath the moon and the stars. He felt small and frightened and alone. Paw over paw, he worked his way down the chutes and tendrils. The owl, uncomfortably close in the pine tree, hooted, and Ralph huddled, shivering in the shadow of a leaf, aware that he was losing precious seconds. A night wind rattled the windows and the owl glided off across the parking lot. 
Ralph inched his way down the vine. It was a long winding route full of detours to the ground floor window, which, to Ralph's relief, was open. Upon reaching the sill, Ralph leaped into, onto the floor of a room which three young men of college age were sleeping, two in beds and one in a sleeping bag on the floor. An aspirin, I must find an aspirin, thought Ralph, darting under the bed. He bumped into a dust mouse, which startled him, but he did not find an aspirin. He was in such a hurry, he ran right over the man in the sleeping bag instead of the taking the time to go around. There, under the dresser, gleaming in the shaft of moonlight, he saw a round white pill. He went closer. Yes, it really was an aspirin tablet. At last! Ralph was positive it was an aspirin and not some other pill because it had letters stamped on it. Ralph could not read the letters, but he knew they stood for an aspirin. He had been warned about them often enough. Now all Ralph had to do was figure out how to get the pill upstairs to room 215. Telling himself that in spite of all that had happened that night, it could not be much past one in the morning, Ralph pushed and pushed and half rolled the aspirin tablet around the man in the sleeping bag to the door. He shoved it under the door and with great difficulty squeezed himself underneath. The first floor carpet was thicker and of better quality than of that on the second floor. Ralph worked his way with the aspirin down the hall to the lobby where the night clerk was sound asleep on the couch. The glassy eyes of the deer heads mounted on the knotty pine wall seemed to stare at Ralph. So did the giant eye of the television set. Slowly he moved his precious load across the lobby to the stairs and there he stopped. How could he manage to get that aspirin up the stairs? He picked it up and tried to lift it, but even though he knew he could not reach the first step with it. The night clerk tossed on the couch and made a gobbling, snorting noise. Ralph dropped the aspirin in a panic and looked wildly around for a hiding place. With one terrified leap, he dived under the grandfather clock between the elevator and the stairs. It was immediately plain from the dust that no one has ever cleaned under the clock. Huh? Huh? Ralph struggled to control a sneeze. Above him, the works of the clock began to make grinding noises. Ha! Ah, ah, choo! The knees, sneeze could not be held back. Bong! The clock struck 1.30, forcing Ralph to clap his hands over his ears. How his famous ancestor, the one that had run up the clock, hickory dickory dock, stood that racket, he did not know. Peeking out, Ralph discovered the night clerk was slept, sleeping soundly through the din, so... He ventured out from under the clock and continued his struggle with the aspirin tablet. Still carrying the pill up the stairs, and it seemed impossible, Ralph was going to have to find another way. The elevator. Ridiculous. A mouse couldn't run an elevator. Then, quite unexpectedly, a whole plan of action popped into his mind. Ralph had a genuine inspiration. First, he rolled the aspirin to a safe place behind the ashtray stand beside the elevator. Then, empty pawed, he climbed the stairs to the second floor and ran down the hall to room 215, where he squeezed under the door. Keith was still half awake, his eyes glinting with fever under their heavy lids. Psst, said Ralph. I found an aspirin for you. Mm-hmm, muttered Keith. An aspirin tablet. I found an aspirin. Where is it? Keith was more awake now. Down on the first floor. Oh, Keith was obviously disappointed. Now wait, said Ralph. I can get it up here, but I've got to have some help. You're going to have to let me take your sports car. You're too young, Keith muttered. I am not. It was true that Ralph felt very much older than he had when he lost the motorcycle. Come on, you need that aspirin, don't you? You already lost my motorcycle. Oh, come on. Ralph was growing more impatient as he felt the night slipping by. If you don't let me take the sports car, will you let me take the ambulance? I guess so. Keith didn't really feel equal to arguing with a determined mouse. He picked up his ambulance from the bedside table and set it on the floor. Here, one more thing, Ralph said anxiously. Do you think you could manage to open the door for me? I know you feel terrible, but this is the last thing I'll ask. I honest, I promise I'll have the aspirin up here in no time. Keith sighed, but he slid his feet out from underneath the sheet and hanging on to the bedside table, reached over and opened the door. Ralph was already seated in the white ambulance with the red cross painted on the side. Wee, wee, wee! He took off around the corner into the hall on two wheels and sped down the bare floor between the wall and the carpet until he came to room 211. Here, he slowed down and went, wee, 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 good and loud. This carried him as he planned to the elevator. This was a crucial moment. Now, he would find out if his plan was going to work. 
The little dog in room 211 began whimpering and then to bark just as Ralph had planned. In a moment, the door opened and the man stumbled out with the little terrier in his arms. Oh, all right, he grumbled. I'll walk you. Shut up, will you? Ralph waited, his paws tense on the steering wheel. The man walked groggily to the closed elevator door where he managed, in spite of the wiggling dog in his arms, to push the button. Soon, the elevator door slid open. Ralph knew that timing was important. The man entered the elevator. The dog barked, wee -oo -oo! Ralph said hard enough and fast enough to shoot the ambulance at great speed across the yawning crack between the floor in the hall and the floor in the elevator before the man turned around. As the dog's owner turned, Ralph steered skillfully around his feet and parked the ambulance behind him. The man pressed the button and the car door closed, the doors closed and the elevator began to descend. Do you know what you are? The man asked the dog. You're a nuisance. That's what you are. A four-footed, hair-covered nuisance. The dog ignored his master. I know you're down there, he yapped at Ralph. If I could just get down, I'd get you. Ralph didn't answer. He was taking no chances. He waited quietly inside his ambulance until the man had carried the dog out before he drove out of the elevator. He jumped out of the ambulance, opened the rear door, seized the precious aspirin, and boosted it inside. Slamming the doors, he ran around and jumped into the driver's seat. There was not an instant to lose. Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. The ambulance moved towards the open elevator, but unfortunately, by the time, Ralph was slightly out of breath. The front wheels of the ambulance caught the crack between the floor in the lobby and the floor of the elevator. The ambulance was stuck. Oh no, thought Ralph. Now, now, I can't fail now. Wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. He managed to gasp. The wheels spun, but the ambulance did not move. Ralph jumped out, put his shoulders into the rear of the vehicle, and pushed with all his strength. Nothing happened, and in a moment, the man would return with his dog. Desperate, Ralph climbed back into the ambulance. He took a breath so deep, he thought his lungs would burst. <gasps> wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo. He made the sound hard and fast and high-pitched. The wheels spun, the ambulance moved slowly at first, and then the tires got grip of the floor of the elevator, and it shot out of the crack and across the elevator hitting the rear wall with a bump. Ralph collapsed over the steering wheel, limp with relief, just as the man came back through the lobby with his dog. I guess some boy lost his toy ambulance, muttered the man, more awake now as he stepped in and pushed the button. Toy, thought Ralph indignantly. This ambulance is carrying medical supplies to the sick. Boy, my foot, yapped the terrier. It's that dastardly mouse let me down and I'll get him. Ralph did not try to answer. He was saving all his breath now to get the ambulance across that crack one more time. The man slapped the dog lightly on the nose and said, Be quiet. I took you outside, didn't I? Fortunately, the elevator door stayed open behind the man as he walked out, so Ralph had no trouble driving the ambulance out and down the hall to room 215. The door had blown shut, but he didn't care. He jumped out of the ambulance and ran around the back where he unloaded the aspirin, shoved it under the bedroom door, and squeezed under after it. Hey, Keith! Ralph said in triumph, I brought you an aspirin. All right, friends, I'll see you tomorrow for our last chapter. Goodbye.